So welcome everyone to the 45th Weather Squadron, part of the 45th Space Wing. We do weather support, or provide weather support for a variety of different organizations. As you can see, we do it for NASA, um, all kinds of launch agencies such as SpaceX, ULA. Um, we also provide weather support obviously for the 45th Space Wing and all the tenant units associated with that. Um, that includes even the Naval Ordnance Test Unit. They're um, a Navy organization that we provide weather support for. So all kinds of support we provide for. Um, and that is divided into kind of two separate entities that provide the support. So if you go to the next slide, you can see we have one, which is WXR. Um, we call it the flight. Um, and it's airfield and range opera weather operations. So they provide that 24-7, 365 weather support. So the day-to-day -day, um, warnings, watches, and advisories that you typically see um, come out here on the space wing, they're doing that every day. You know, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, when y'all are all asleep, they're doing their job. And so Aaron Mulcahy is one of our um, duty forecasters who's providing that support day-to-day. -day. Now on the next slide, so um, this is the space lift. Um, this is our space lift flight. So basically, this flight provides support for um, all of our launch agencies. This is for launch. So basically, all phases of the launch. So we've got the generation, execution, and recovery phases of launch that we provide support for. Um, so generation includes, you know, stacking operations, um, any types of exercises such as static fires, um, and all of that buildup from the time that that launch vehicle arrives on station, we're providing weather support for. Um, and then execution, of course, day of launch. That's the fun stuff, that's the countdown. Um, and then it all culminates to that climactic moment um, where we make that go, no go call as a weather team. Um, and then the recovery phase. So not to forget the recovery phase, we also provide support for that. Um, some of our launch agencies, like SpaceX, they, um, they do recover um, their first stage or parts of their vehicle. And we provide support for that um, because they send a barge out to complete the ocean and recover those parts. And um, they need to know, you know, sea surface conditions and all that. Um, so that's all good stuff. And finally, if you go to the next slide, you can see this flight. Um, uh, they, they don't have quite as sexy of a job, but uh, they do provide good support. And this is a technic training technology integration, basically. They manage all of our weather systems. So we are very unique uh, weather squadron because we have 10 very unique super systems um, that we utilize day to day and during launch ops. And it's because our mission is so unique um, and we do that launch stuff. So, um, so yeah, we have them. They help maintain those systems. And um, yeah, they provide good support for us um, so that we can do our job day of launch. But that kind of spiel of the 45th Weather Squadron as a whole. Now why you guys are here and what's so exciting to us, <laughs> we're so excited, <laughs> is because this is the first ever time where on the Eastern Range, um, we have an all-female launch weather team. And my team is all here, so I'll go down the line, you can explain okay, your name and then what you do. Uh, hey, good morning everybody, my name is uh, Arlena Moses. I am the lead launch weather officer for this mission. Uh, the, in summary, that means that I am this person responsible, the point of contact for everybody here on the launch weather team to talking to both the people managing our range, so the people during the operation, uh, also talking to our launch customer, in this case it's SpaceX, uh, relaying all the weather decisions we make as a team to them. So we're speaking as one voice uh, out to the, to the range. I'm also, I'm also responsible for doing the lead up forecast uh, so doing all of the uh, launch weather forecasts, I'm sure you guys have seen already, uh, looking at those probability of violations um, and the temperatures and the weather. Uh, also doing the forecast for any of those uh, previous operations, such as if we have had a static fire, when they're moving the vehicles, uh, even when it arrives here on station, and then also afterwards with all the recovery operations uh, that SpaceX does out on their uh, recovery drone ships. Uh, so that's my job uh, for you know, the launch weather team or anybody who's serving as the lead launch weather officer in this case. And then also next to us, we have... Hi everyone, my name is Melody Levin. For this mission, I will be the reconnaissance elbow. Uh, so basically what that means is if Arlena 
tells me that we need to look into some cloud cover um, that may potentially be giving us a lightning comet cr criteria violation. And we're trying to maybe uh, see if we can get out of some of that criteria uh, because the radar sometimes overfills the beam and tells us uh, that tells us more information than what's actually occurring in the atmosphere. So uh, basically sometimes we have a uh, Weather One aircraft and I would be interfacing with that aircraft and uh, telling them where to go. And sometimes that aircraft can tell us that actually clouds that appear to be connected on radar are not actually connected. Um, they, sometimes we can just see more information with the aircraft and sometimes that makes us go in account when normally we would be no-go. So we don't always use the aircraft. Uh, we're still not sure if, uh, you know, when exactly this launch will occur, if we will be using an aircraft for this mission, but that would be my job uh, if we do, in fact, use the aircraft. So I will move on to Jessica Williams. Hi, I'm the radar launch weather officer for this launch. My name is Jessica Williams, and I will sit right here and monitor every radar scan, which comes in every three minutes, and what I'm monitoring Four is the altitude where the top of the cloud is and the depth of the cloud because that would tell us whether it will go or no go for our 10th uh, launch commit criteria weather rules. And as Melody said, oftentimes the aircraft will go out and help us verify those cloud tops or cloud thicknesses. Hi, right, good morning, everybody. I'm Major Emily Grays. I will be the launch weather commander for this mission. Um, essentially, I'm just kind of overseeing the launch weather team as a whole. I'm making sure that they have what they need in order to do their jobs. If there's any issues, I'm also the liaison to any senior leaders. If there's questions and things that, that come up outside of the normal briefs we do, I kind of help manage that. And then another key role is if we do violate a rule and we are no go for a rule, if our team wants to go back to go, I just help make the, the final call on that. Mulcahy. Good morning everybody, I'm Erin Mulcahy. On the WXR side, we focus mostly on resource protection. Um, the big thing is just to be in communication with the launch weather officers and just to let them know if there are any threats in the atmosphere that would hinder the launch. Thanks. Yeah, and then my position finally is the launch weather director, so I'm Captain Nancy Zimmerman, I don't think I mentioned before. Um, yeah, so I, along with Major Graves, we provide the oversight for the team. So essentially, if anything goes wrong, so systems, um, any calm, um, calm outage happens, or our weather systems start tweaking out, um, I am that point of contact to ensure that it gets fixed. Um, I'm the person who will be executing all of the um, emergency launch checklists, and basically just directing any resources where um, I deem applicable. So that's what the launch weather director does. And I do apologize, this is, we're doing real-time ops here on the floor, so you may hear your calls and all kinds of gibberish and jabber um, around the, the ops floor. We're just doing our job, so. Um, any questions for the launch weather team as a whole here before we split into our sections? Yes, ma'am. How did you decide to do the all-female um, situation? How did that come about? Was that your decision? So, no, actually, but... Um, I was part of the decision a little bit. Um, I was discussing, so our flight commander, he is this baseless flight commander, Captain Fontenot. Um, he uh, basically looked at this launch upcoming and he, I think he put together the, the crew and was like, wow, all of these launch weather officers and all of these personnel are female. Wouldn't this make a great story? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and then we finally discovered, we did some research and we were like, wow, this is actually is the first time, for real, no kidding, that it's been an all-female um, launch weather team here on the Eastern Range, at least. Possibly even on the Western Range, but uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah, that's how it came about, and we're super excited for that. And why is it then that this has been the first time that it's an all-female weather squadron? I mean, um, were there just not that many females working in the weather squadron before? Correct. Or? So one of the key reasons for that is because, so um, essentially in the 2000s, so typically we have, I forgot to mention this, a lot of um, our launch weather officers, or at least our permanent launch weather officers, those who have, um, who lead programs such as um, Arlena, Melody, and um, Jess, they all lead programs. So those are all designated for civilian positions. 
Well, um, the first actual female civilian position for launch weather that we had was, um, I don't know if you know the name or not, but Miss Kathy Rice, formerly Kathy Winters. And she, yes, she was the launch weather officer for NASA for the longest time, and she did all the weather support for all the shuttle era launches. Um, and she was the only one for the longest time. And then not up until maybe a couple of years ago, we had a, a mass changer changeover of launch weather officers, just, you know, for them going to other positions and other locations. And um, we acquired three incredible, amazing, uh, <laughs> female launch weather officers. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, we didn't go and select them because they were female. Their credentials were outstanding, so that's why we selected them. Actually, all of which, you guys are all from the National Weather Service as well. Um, so they come in with a bunch of forecasting uh, experience and knowledge. And it just so happened, yeah, that's how we kind of buffed up our um, civilian female crew. And then um, in addition to that, turns out we also have, you know, active duty uh, personnel who also take place in the team. And just so happens we have um, our assistant um, operations officer is Major Gray, female. And then duty forecaster, female. And then myself, female. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, we also have um, our new director of operation or operations officer is in fact also female. So we're excited for her to be joining the team as well. So yeah, it's just on the up and up from here. So I have a question. Um, they said 10 launch criteria that decide if a rocket's going to go off, I mm -hmm. think she said. Can we get those 10 things that decide if the rocket is yes. launching? Yeah, yeah, the first one is the surface electric field mill rule. That's to tell us how much electricity is in the air. Obviously, we don't want to launch if there's a lot more charge in the atmosphere because the rocket could then trigger a lightning strike. Which was one of the ones for the... Yes. That, one. that was that violated was, during the, yeah, the, the crew day. Yes, yeah. it was. Okay. Yes, the second one is the lightning rule. So if there's any lightning within 10 nautical miles, we'd be no-go for 30 minutes. We have to wait 30 minutes after that. The third one is the cumulus cloud rule. So those puffy cumulus clouds yeah. that we get every day in Florida. And the taller it is, the um, closer it can be, the further away it can be for us to still be no-go. Um, so we'd have a flight through, a flight within five nautical miles if it's even taller, and a flight within 10 nautical miles if it's even taller. Then we have the attached anvil cloud rule. So when a thunderstorm forms, you get that wispy anvil. Mm -hmm. And if that stays attached to the parent thunderstorm and it goes into the flight path or within three nautical miles, we could be no go. Okay. Then there's a detached anvil cloud rule. That's number five, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so if that anvil cloud detaches and produces lightning and goes over the the pad would be no go. And then there's the debris cloud rule, six. So if a thunderstorm forms and then collapses um, and is near the pad, we'd be no go because there's still a lot of charge in that thunderstorm. And there's the thick cloud layer rule. This happens a lot in the winter time or if there's a tropical system over the area. So if there's a cloud that's 4,500 feet thick, that's between the zero and minus 20 degrees Celsius temperature range in the aptitude of the atmosphere, we'd be no go. And there's a smoke plume rule. So if someone's burning a fire accidentally or you know the fire happens and the smoke plume goes over the pad, we would be no go because there's charged particles in that smoke plume. And then the last one is the triboelectrification rule and most vehicles are exempt, exempt from number 10 because they're treated for that. So that's basically, if they're not treated for that, pretty much any cloud would make it no go. <laughs> I remember that from the days of Aries 1X. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you learn a word. Um, how, how much of, of the weather calls are, are automated based on like the field mills are telling you something, so there's obviously like that's hard data. And, and how much of it is a, like that kind of a rule where no hard data says no versus the visual flying up or good sense rules on the day? How, how often do you think those interplay with one another? They mix, yeah, so it's, it's pretty much a hard and fast rule. Um, when it gets a little fuzzy and we have to go on the conservative route, is if sometimes you get so much cloud cover, it's first cumulus cloud and then it kind of rains itself out and it's n it doesn't necessarily have that structure of a cumulus cloud, but it's still cloud cover, still raining. 
Um, we have to determine whether that's a cumulus cloud or a thick cloud or a debris cloud, and we go with the most conservative route. That is absolutely where the plane helps us. So if we think it's a thick cloud, 4,500 feet thick, and the plane goes in and it says, no, it's actually two levels of cloud, and neither of them are 4,500 foot thick, we could be go when we might have said we'd be no go on the radar. From a from a day to day standpoint, even when we're not launching uh, out of here, can you walk us through like what your jobs are to protect all the not just the technology but all the people who work out here on giant steel structures in the middle of the afternoon in Florida? <laughs> right. Yeah. So so for your day to day ops, that's more like we were uh, talking about Airman up Mulcahy. So she's one of the twenty four seven uh, forecasters. So they have, they work out of here, and we also have um, a weather operations office down at Patrick Air Force Base, and that's more specifically for the actual flying crews down there. So, for instance, the 920th uh, Rescue Wing, they, they support them as well. So they're in here doing their 24-7, they're using radar, satellite, what we call MET watching, which is meteorological watching. So for any kind of threats we have, they're the ones who are coordinating all of our watches, our warnings, our advisory. They make sure it gets sent out, it goes to command posts, and then they, they disseminate it to everybody working across uh, Patrick Air Force Base, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, as well as Kennedy Space Center. So we cover kind of all that. Do you guys work in conjunction then with the National Weather Service to make sure you guys drive together, or you, like, do your... So I know that, um, and you could probably correct me, I, I know that um, we obviously reference their their forecast as far as working with them I know that we do like we'll do our um, forecaster exchange program or we'll go visit their office they'll, they'll visit our office and we kind of learn each other's processes and then during tropical season we uh, kind of do like a tropical weather kind of a, a teleconference with them as well and you probably if you have anything to add to that that's kind of the, the gist I think of our interaction with them they play a role in the launches as well. We ask them to change their radar setting so that it's a little better for us during our launches. And sometimes they are here to support if we have um, an interplanetary mission and there's concerns, uh, they'll come in and, and be here as well. Yeah, so those actually uh, go through the RG Next uh, company. They're actually contractors and they actually work out at, um, at the what we call the weather um, balloon facility here on um, Cape Canaveral. And as far as how often they're, they're launch off, so we get one launch, they have one that we launch every single day and they, they give us all the upper air data. And then as far as during launches, I believe that's customer based. So they'll coordinate directly with SpaceX or ULA. They'll get, hey, we need this many balloons. We want them released this far apart to get a picture of, of, of the atmosphere. How much interaction do you have with other ranges, like out of wallops? Are there shared assets that would that you guys would use to support a wallops launch or like coming launches from Boca Chica? that'll be coming eastward so as far as like launch like directly like actual launch operational um, support we mostly just follow that the eastern range actual um, support but I know that we coordinate with some of the other launches such as the weather flight that's out at Vandenberg mm -hmm. we meet with them at least you know telecoms at least once a month and we uh, have a lot of similar processes and we kind of exchange programs and things but as far as the operational process here, we just focus on the actual eastern range. And, and that is defined solely as here, not including Wallops, which is on Correct. the east coast of yes, the sir. U.S. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we, uh, I think the latest I heard was it's about a 200 nautical mile radius kind of in the area. Okay. That includes, you know, Patrick, Cape, as well as uh, Kennedy Space Center. So like, for example, on the last one, this has come yes, back sir. yet. Um, <laughs> it was really cloudy. And it was. We yep. lost it within like 45 yeah, seconds. The and there they come. Here they come. Wait, did you guys have a plan in the air to determine, or was that just like your We radar? did. So yeah. for the last launch, we did, and it was Weather One who actually gave us some information that kind of helped us get out of our, our no go rules. Gotcha. How, um, with like how busy things are going to be getting yeah. here because it's you know so we know like 48 is the goal hopefully this year maybe next year uh -huh. to reach um but there but there's everything else that goes into it because it's not just 48 launches a year it's the production right. how are you guys prepping for that <laughs> um yeah. and also like some of those environmental impact reports from SpaceX seem to indicate they want to go up to 150 times a year <laughs> out of here how 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 is the wing sort of preparing for both of those eventualities as as everything grows here right that's a great great question so uh they actually uh studied this you know a few years ago and they decided when they needed to hire more launch weather officers so that's <laughs> part of the reason why i'm here 
um, because they decided they needed to really expand that. Um, so last year we actually had a few vacancies. Um, this is part of the reason why so many of us are new. Uh, and also a lot of um, the greats from the past uh, have retired or moved on to bigger and better things. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, um, we're hiring more and more people all the time. Um, and every year, you know, they do a study to see if we're properly meeting our manning and uh, then they make the decisions from there. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we're certainly watching that and we're trying to make sure uh, we're not falling behind there. Um, but it certainly is getting exciting. Absolutely. From a forecasting standpoint, because Florida is so odd and dynamic and wonderful, um, how, what's the biggest challenge? like on a, on a daily basis that, that you would say is, is sort of the, the biggest challenge? Yeah. Um, so I think we both can answer this question. Yes. For me, I would say a scenario like this morning, honestly. <laughs> honestly. Yes, yeah. the sea breeze, yeah. yes. Yeah, so this morning, um, we, you know, if you're only watching certain models, they're not going to catch, they're not going to capture uh, things like uh, what happened this morning with early morning showers. So what we try to do with, for ourselves um, is, is uh, knowing what the dynamic flow regimes are for the state. And I, I, this is really uh, impactful specifically for the summertime regime. So this morning uh, we're in an easterly regime and we know when that happens we normally get uh, coastal showers in the morning. So even if the models aren't picking up on it, uh, you know, we we know that that tends to happen, and we try to remember that as we forecast that. Um, so the hardest part to me is just sticking with what you know should happen, even if the models aren't showing it. You you just have to, you know, always be learning and studying and remembering, most importantly, um, your meteorology for this local area. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. So each each launch is different. Some launches uh, cannot, you know, have any moderate precipitation occurring, um, and some it's totally fine. Uh, our biggest concern is if something like this is triggering or or causing lightning already naturally. Um, so this morning, even though we had a lot of showers move through, I don't think we had any lightning strikes. Actually, if you look at um, right over here, this is the uh, lightning. That we only had lightning across, you know, South Florida. Um, so this is part of what we use with our tools to see, you know, if what's out there is actually going to cause lightning. Um, and if we were watching our balloon data this morning, we were quite dry aloft, and normally that means uh, that we're only going to get low-level showers. It's not going to be strong enough to build above that. Um, if I remember from the opening, um, you previously worked for the National Weather Service. That's correct. How do you how, how do you feel that like do you feel that was good schooling <laughs> for, for for here where where like calls have to be made like with thirty seconds notice? Yes, something. Yeah, because the National Weather Service makes the the, the forecasters there make the same kind kind of calls. You know, they're also making uh, life or death decisions in terms of the warnings. Uh, you know, putting out the products, helping uh, the emergency managers. So, you know, it's we, uh, you know, we have a much more specialized uh, function, but the the overall mission is is you know in the same wheelhouse. Well, the last two hours of the launch, we are doing the weather, actual weather evaluation. That's when we're doing the final. We have Jess Williams sitting at the radar in this case, and if we had Melody sitting as the reconnaissance officer, uh, all the team is here. We're doing those final weather evaluations, you know, constantly. Every time we get new data coming in, we're evaluating the wind data, we're evaluating uh, clouds, lightning, anything that may be of importance. So it's kind of just that process and rhymes and repeat <laughs> until we get. Um, yeah, and then communicating that information to the customer. Uh, obviously, ideally, uh, we're just getting on and telling the customer, we're all good to go. <laughs> and, you know, no, no problems. If we have a case, uh, of course, most people are familiar with the crew demo mission uh, a couple weeks ago. In a case like that, 
we are constantly in contact with the customer and contact with the rest of the range operations, uh, letting them know what's going on. When do we think things may get better? If we don't think things will get better, uh, it's a, it can get very hectic in that kind of situation. Yes, each each uh, each launch customer, in this case SpaceX, uh, and each mission, depending on what their payload is, uh, whether it's satellites in this case or it's humans. Uh, <laughs> In, in, pre, in a recent case, uh, each have different criteria, weather criteria. They're, they're specific for the mission. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily treat uh, any launch any different than others. We're always monitoring the same criteria uh, that we are supposed to be looking at, whether the safety ones or the, or the customer ones, uh, to ensure that we are uh, going to have a safe launch. So a, uh, about a month ago, we had the Atlas that had that really weird weather pattern that yeah. set up right, and, and we had this call I've never heard uh, doing this for decades, um, where the weather officer said, go pending? How, how, how do you know how that decision was made? Like, how did we get into a situation on that day where the weather was clearly not go, but the decision was made to say, let's, let's pick up the count and see what happens? Like, how, how are those decisions made when weather is like right on the line of acceptable and not acceptable. In, in that case, I, I wasn't on the team, so I can't speak to exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, actually, Jess Williams was the lead launch weather oh, officer for, have asked for her. that one. <laughs> 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 if you haven't talked to her already, that would be a perfect question her. for her. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's always a, the open dialogue with the customer, um, and what uh, you know we we convey to the best of our abilities what the weather is and what we expect it to do, um, and you know they come back with us about potential decisions they'd like to make. Uh. Um, so I you know I can't say what happened in that particular case, uh, but you know I always, I know it's always a, a dialogue with the customer about what what's going on. So that's when we get that like eh, it may or may not. Let's see, it's a conversation. With yeah, the it's a conversation with the customer. Okay, yes. gotcha. Um, it, it depends on what the particular criteria are. There's two groups. We have the user criteria, ULAs or SpaceX's, and we have the range safety criteria. Um, user criteria, they know their equipment and payloads best, so those are their decisions to make. The range safety uh, is usually something we can't waive because those are pretty well-known and very heavily researched rules. <laughs> not, not quite like that. It's experience has taught us um, that uh, you know we've, there's been some instances in the past where uh, you know things have in the way past, not any time recent, but you know such as the uh, AC 1987 incident that shown if you know we, we want to stick to these criteria because bad things can happen when we don't. When you have weird situations like the go pending, do you ever go back and look at that, look at the radar from that day, look, like kind of study it, and like if this happens again, we'll be a little bit more prepared. I know every day is slightly different, but Florida, we always have you know pretty consistent weather. Well, we always do what we, we do internal after action reports and, and studies and uh, yes, for every launch, uh, we all go through and kind of go what went right, what went wrong, what we can fix in the future. We do it both kind of right after the launch, the hot wash, I don't know if anybody's heard that term, um, and then we do it down the road. Um, and then we all are kind of responsible for uh, reading up on all the previous launches, whether or not we were on the team to determine uh, what we can all do better in the future. So we're constantly improving and getting better. Sure. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, so we're part of the 45th Weather Squadron. Um, here we support um, kind of two missions. We do um, a 24-7, 365 mission, um, basically resource protection for the Space Wing and all the tenant units and other launch agencies that are a part of KSC and the Cape Canaveral Air Force um, Station. And uh, as well as Patrick Air Force Base now, or Space Force Base now. <laughs> Hard to keep track of. Um, and um, the other half is kind of the space lift side of things. So basically, we provide weather support for all types of launches um, and for all launch agencies, so SpaceX, ULA. Um, North of Grumman, all those launch agencies, and basically that's through the generation, execution, and recovery phases of launch. So generation includes 
anything uh, from the time that vehicle arrives onto um, any of our locations here on the Cape or Patrick, um, we're providing weather support for that. Um, and then the execution, obviously, um, day of launch, the count, all leading up to the climactic, um, you know, go, no, go call that we make for weather. And then recovery. So recovery is anything like SpaceX, they have a barge out there that we have to forecast um, sea conditions for, for that. Um, so, so I, I know like from a, from a emergency response readiness, the static fires of the Falcon 9s are kind of treated like launch because you're fueling the vehicle, you're lighting the engines. Um, yeah. How does weather impact static fires? If the vehicle's not actually leaving the pad and is protected by its lightning protection system, would they be allowed to static fire in the middle of a thunderstorm? Uh, <laughs> yes, we've actually done it, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, you wouldn't think so, but of course um, their criteria isn't as stringent as for a typical launch, but we do. We are one of the few entities on the range that provide support for, you know, during the static fire. Um, the weather squadron does. You know, a lot of people are at, back at home, um, but we're still here supporting that. Um, so yeah, um, thresholds for wind are a lot higher, but, um, you know, we provide wind conditions and then also thunderstorms but um but yeah we're still here forecasting that right, if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah so right not the 10 lightning launch commit criteria we're not forecasting that it's simply their user conditions so wind for them yeah. right gotcha mm -hmm. um and and similarly like um like we know social media and following across the country the srbs for sls1 are on their way and arriving soon do you guys have a role in whether like hey weather's too iffy you can't come over the drawbridge yet you've got to wait it out like how, how does weather interact with deliveries of, of fueled components yeah so we do provide weather support um, for any um, anything that's on its way to KSC um, and um, I have to verify on that whether we do provide weather support you know outside of you know our area of responsibility right um, but you know once it gets on the cake, you know, we are forecasting other conditions for it. Gotcha. Right, definitely our air, within our area responsibility, yes, we're providing weather support. So once it enters, you know, the KSC Cape Canaveral gates, you know, we're providing that support for them. For the drive to 48 is obviously the goal right now. We hope to get there next year. Um, but we've seen environmental impact assessments from SpaceX talking about upwards of 150 launches a year when Starship comes on. Line. How is the wing preparing Ooh. for both of those? <laughs> uh, we are preparing. So I like to say, uh, I think our new motto should be to infinity and beyond. Yeah. Really, that's where it's headed. Um, and we are, you know, running, it's a sprint essentially to get things prepared. And we are preparing here with the Weather Squadron. We're definitely doing it. Um, already, we're doing multi operations for different launch agencies. So different launch weather officers are on the floor providing weather support at the same time for different operations. We're doing it. Um, um, and of course, um, we're definitely running into some issues with, with, you know, having so many operations, you know, more than I think three, so with four, um, but we're adapting and we're letting those um, concerns be known and um, with that, you know, we're, we're definitely adapting. To a team, yeah, so, yeah, so there's essentially one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, at least six. Um, so, you know, like if a civilian radar goes down, it's not a huge deal, others can jump in and cover, but um, what, 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 all, what steps are taken to make sure like that on launch day, a critical radar, a critical monitoring station doesn't go down? So we do have backups for everything. Ah. Often, yeah. <laughs> so we have our own radar, which is a WSR, weather surveillance radar, and then we also utilize as a backup the National Weather Service radar. Ah, okay. Yes. Cool. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm ready. <laughs> It was a wonderful challenge to try to explain to people on Demo 2 why clouds not naturally creating lightning can trigger a lightning violation warning in Cornia. Yeah. Trying to explain all that like from a simplified yeah. weather perspective. Yeah. <laughs> how would you, how would you explain that? Yeah. Electrons or protons is the question. Electric field, actually. So basically, if you had any cloud cover, um, and a lot of our rules that we evaluate for involve cloud cover or electric field, 
um, surface electric field. So basically, when that builds up in the atmosphere and it interacts with the um, the rocket plume, and it has its own kind of electric field, it distorts all the field, and then boom, triggered lightning. And what are you using? Uh, we do have um, surface electric field mills here that measure the electric field in the atmosphere. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because I think I called VM2 the lightning trifecta. It was like there was an anvil oh, cloud, a triggered lightning rule, and like a natural lightning rule. Like it was like all that you could yes. possibly have for lightning in right. place. Yeah. I didn't work that long, but it must yeah. have been real stressful. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying like, oh, no one wants to be Mike today. No. No. <laughs> oh, Mike. Yeah. But he was the best man for the job because he is the most experienced of all of us. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming here. Good luck. Here. Yes. Appreciate it.